Hello, I'm Jennifer Apodaca, one of Sun Prairie's Directors of Student Services. And on behalf of Janet Thomas, the other director, and myself, I'm proud to present this report to the school board and the Sun Prairie community on special education and adult transition. This report has been developed following the board guidelines for 2024-25 presentations with special consideration given to survey feedback provided by four of our seven board members. The scope of special education is as broad as public education itself, and as such, this report contains a hefty amount of information. Before we begin, I have a few suggestions to support the cognitive load on your brain. First, my voice will be the one voice you will hear, and this has been done by design. All of us behind this work believe it will be easier for those listening to not have to transition between speakers and presentation styles. Next, you will not need to navigate away from the slide deck for any part of this presentation. The slides should contain all of the information you need and I will support the content with my words. The school board has asked me to explain some complex concepts, especially related to special education funding. I will be as clear as possible, but please do not hesitate to pause this presentation in order to process or review the information shared. And finally, Janet and I will be joining you all on October 14th in person to expand upon or clarify any content shared. If you feel called to share your questions with us ahead of time, our brains would appreciate a little extra processing time. And that's it, let's get started. Our district vision, mission, and core values guide our decision-making and selection of success indicators for our comprehensive system of special education services and supports. We ask ourselves questions like, how will this decision support our long-term vision as it relates to academic, social-emotional, post-secondary performance for students with disabilities? Is this decision representative of every child where we think of disability as culture? Does this increase relevance of experiences for students with disabilities? And does this increase student engagement in the experiences we offer? We also ask, is this innovative? Did we get outside of the box using creativity, stretching ourselves within our local contexts to come to this place? And finally, are each of our core values re represented and respected through this decision and through our implementation? Special education is in service to our core educational offerings, and therefore in service to our district vision, mission, and core values. This is a grounding principle. In order to understand the present, we need to ground ourselves in recent history. IDEA is public education law that we are obligated and honored to follow. Special education is required like I said, it's required by law. On November 9th in 1975, Congress authorized the Education for All Handicapped Children Act. This law was reauthorized and renamed the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, in 1990. If we do the math on that, special education is young. It's only 49 years old. We are making history. And finally, special education is in service of the universal public school experience. It was never intended to be a standalone service. It was designed to allow children with disabilities who had previously been absent from public schools the right to receive a free and appropriate public education. We call that FAPE. Similar to other civil rights education laws, IDEA has gone from an implementation that started off as substantially separate to an experience that is encouraged to be primarily integrated. Special education is a form of instruction designed to meet the unique needs of students with disabilities. Through special education, we provide individualized support and accommodations to help students succeed academically, socially, and emotionally. Special education services address a range of disabilities, including physical, cognitive, emotional, developmental, and learning disabilities. And additionally, special education comes with its own terminology and acronyms. We have boiled it down to six components that we believe are important for you to know. Please take a moment to read through these terms.
Having established a basic shared understanding of special education and why it is required in all of our public schools, along with some of the key concepts of special education and how special education supports and promotes our district vision, mission, and core values, we are ready to take a look at how Sun Prairie special education enrollment, funding, and programming have changed over the years. This slide provides an overview of special education enrollment in Sun Prairie since the 2017-18 school year of both students with disabilities and our total student enrollment. It also provides an overview of the percentage of our total student enrollment that has been represented by students with disabilities each year. It includes total costs, which is inclusive of federal, state, and local dollars, and represents the total amount of money spent annually on the cost of special education. And finally, how this translates into an annual cost per pupil with a disability per year. Let's dive deeper into enrollment. First of all, enrollment of students with disabilities reflects move-ins and move-outs and students who age in and students who age out, just like our overall district enrollment. What's different, however, is that enrollment of students with disabilities also reflects students who qualify and students who are dismissed from special education as a result of the formal evaluation process. So when we look at enrollment trends of students and enrollment trends of students with disabilities, we see that our overall district enrollment profile and our students with disabilities enrollment profiles are about the same that can be seen on the line graph. No dramatic increases or decreases have, experienced, have been experienced over time. What is noteworthy, however, when we take a look more deeply into the information in the table on the left, is that the number of students with disabilities in Sun Prairie is growing faster than our total enrollment is growing. This is due to a variety of factors, but the impact is the same. The percentage of our total student population requiring special education services has continuously grown over the last nine years. At the same time, if we look at per pupil spending over the past five years, it has increased by 9%, while CPI, the Consumer Price Index, or inflation, increased at a rate of 12.31%. Therefore, we are increasing overall per pupil spending at a rate that's lower than inflation. This portion of the report was specifically requested by board members via feedback through a survey. We were asked to provide a deeper than usual financial analysis. Therefore, by the end of this section, you will understand the concept of excess costs, the three funding sources for special education costs, what those three funding sources have looked like in our Sun Prairie Area School District special education budget over time, and how our budget compares with Dane County and other size alike districts. Let's begin with the concept of excess costs. When we budget for special education, we budget for the costs of services that are in excess of what we would provide if we had zero students with disabilities in our district. These costs are referred to as excess costs. We do this because students with disabilities are part of the general education population of schoolgoers. There are costs with them, there are costs associated with them simply attending school, just like other students. Any direct cost that's incurred when providing special education instruction and related services that are unique to the needs of students with disabilities and that would not exist if those students didn't exist are called excess costs. And Fund 27, 
is the fund that we use for excess costs associated with special education only. So all special education costs must ultimately be paid for out of Fund 27. Transitioning to the three funding sources of special education excess costs. The DPI shared an overview of special education funding in Wisconsin at the Wisconsin Federal Funding Conference back in February of 2024. This slide has been taken from that presentation. Special education is paid for by a mix of money from the federal government, state, and local communities, and here's how it works. In federal money, the money from the U.S. government, the U.S. government gives Wisconsin some money to help with special education through a law called IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act that we talked about at the beginning. This money gets distributed across school districts through a formula. It doesn't cover the whole cost. It covers about 10 to 15 percent of special education costs in school districts in Wisconsin. State money. Through state statute, Wisconsin gives schools some money to also help pay for special education. And this money comes in the form of aids and grants. This money doesn't pay for everything involved in special education. Over time in Wisconsin, it's covered about 25 to 30 percent of each public school district's costs of special education. So schools need to find other ways to pay for the rest of the costs. And that's where local money comes in. This is money that comes from the community through our tax base. Because the state and federal government don't pay for all of the costs associated with the provision of special education, local communities through taxes help pay the rest of the costs for special education. This tends to come out to about 60% of the costs across districts in the state of Wisconsin. Let's dive into each funding source a little more deeply, starting with federal funding, most commonly known as flow through or IDEA funding. Federal funding costs approximately 10 to 15 percent of excess costs of providing special education services in districts in Wisconsin. This slide represents DPI's language as to how Wisconsin determines how to distribute the federal IDEA flow through money among Wisconsin school districts. I'm not going to speak in detail about this, but wanted to provide you with the opportunity to dig into this slide and the subsequent two slides on your own. If understanding the federal IDEA flow through allocation determination formula is an area of particular interest for you. Taking the words from the previous slide, those words are shown to you here in a different way. And finally, let's pretend that those original words and the visual on the previous slide are Sun Prairie and the state is calculating our federal IDEA flow through allocation right now. Please note the numbers on this slide in the green rows and the blue rows are not actual representative, actually representative of the Sun Prairie Area School District. This slide just takes the previous two slides and puts it into an example in the formula to show you how the IDEA flow through funding formula is determined. As you've reviewed these slides, you may note that nowhere in the process are the actual numbers of students with disabilities in a district taken into consideration. I'll say that again. Nowhere in the calculation of the formula are a district's total numbers of students with disabilities taken into consideration.
In addition to IDEA flow-through federal funds, districts have the option to receive additional money through Medicaid reimbursement. We have participated in Medicaid reimbursement since 2006. This process is managed by the Wisconsin Department of Health Services, and it provides us with reimbursement for eligible costs that we provide per the school-based services Medicaid program rules. There are three ways to receive Medicaid reimbursement. The first is interim SBS or school-based services billing. The second is Medicaid administrative claiming. And the third is cost settlement. Interim SBS billing requires our staff to complete additional service documentation and to submit billing logs. The larger the caseload, the more paperwork and billing our staff have to complete in order to achieve this reimbursement. The Medicaid administrative claiming offers federal reimbursement for the costs of administrative activities that support the deliverer of direct services. Things like outreach, um, eligibility determination, program planning, uh, arranging for and planning for programming and transportation and transition. And then finally, the cost settlement takes eligible Medicaid allowable costs and it looks at the difference between the amount billed for and the amount that we were eligible for. If we build for more than we were eligible for, we have to pay it back. We've never had to do that. If we don't bill for as many hours as were potentially available for, we receive some level of settlement. Like I said before, Sun Prairie has opted into Medicaid reimbursement since 2026. This chart represents Medicaid reimbursement by category the three categories I previously spoke about over the past seven years. As you look at this chart, there's a few things to note. Because this reimbursement for costs incurred, uh, because this is reimbursement for costs that have already been incurred, it's important to know that there is a lag in reimbursement. Interim billing reimbursement does occur throughout the year that the service logs are submitted that money goes directly into Fund 27. MAC payments go directly into Fund 10 and therefore have to be transferred into Fund 27. And we receive those funds the year after the costs are incurred. And finally, cost settlement funds go directly to Fund 10 and then have to be transferred into Fund 27, but we receive those funds two years after the costs are incurred. We close our study of federal funding sources for special education excess costs by providing you with our total federal expenditures over the past two years. I'm sorry, over the past seven years. While we have included 2023-24 numbers, please note that these numbers have not yet been finalized through our audit and therefore are unofficial numbers. And as we finish out this section, remember that federal funding sources have historically covered between 10 and 15% of the excess costs of providing special education in Wisconsin. Here, you can see how that has played out in Wisconsin over the past seven years, both in dollars and percent. We explored federal funding. Now let's see how the state contributes to public school districts funding of the excess costs of special education. State funding covers approximately 25 to 30% of the excess costs of special education in school districts in Wisconsin. This funding comes in the form of categorical aid that's been written into state statute. And there are two types of categorical aid that make up this funding. There is special education aid, which is the primary categorical aid program. And there's high cost special education aid, which provides districts with additional funding 
for individual students with exceptionally significant and costly needs that come out to greater than $30,000. Special education aid far exceeds what's provided by the feds through IDEA flow through money. And it's available only for salary and benefits of licensed teachers, aides, and related service providers, transportation, and a few other costs. And there are strict requirements for reimbursement. Reimbursement comes at about 27 to 31% of costs incurred. Therefore, the remainder has to be picked up by local or federal funds. For high cost special education aid, it provides us with some level of assistance or reimbursement for the costs of services provided to students that are greater than $30,000 cumulatively. It's an optional aid program and we absolutely participate annually. Claims are submitted the year after expenses are occurred and aid is paid out the following June after a, a full year after the costs. Amounts over $30,000 are eligible for reimbursement, but at 90%, and they are further prorated based upon available funding. So I'll say that again. Amounts over $30,000, total costs spent on students over $30,000 are eligible for 90% reimbursement. However, that reimbursement rate is further prorated based upon the pool of money that is available for all high cost reimbursement across the state. An additional source of state funding is awarded through transition grants. The transition incentive aid is not really a grant. Since 2015, this aid has been provided for positive response rates to a post-secondary indicator that's part of our accountability as school districts through the, to the state through the state performance plan, which I'm going to discuss later. So LEAs receive $1,000 or a prorated amount. I believe that it's been about $900 um, for each survey response indicating that a former student met their post high school um, stated goals. The transition readiness grant is a competitive grant where the state makes about $1.5 million available on a competitive, that means an application basis, that it distributes across the state. It's intended to fund evidence-based practices related to the successful transition from high school for students with IEPs. This grant has been considered, we consider it every single year, but we have never chosen to apply. The administrative and compliance costs associated with this grant have been greater than the money that has ever been available for award. We close out our study of state funding sources for special education excess costs by providing you with our total state expenditures over the past seven years. Again, while we've included 2020, 20, 23, 24 numbers, please note that these have not yet been finalized through our audit. Remember that state funding sources have historically covered 25 to 30 percent of excess costs of providing special education in Wisconsin. And here you can see how that has played out in Sun Prairie over the past seven years. Having explored federal and state contributions to public school district funding of the excess costs of special education, let's move to local funding, the largest source for funding of special education. Approximately 60% of the excess costs of providing special education services in Wisconsin comes from the tax levy. This covers the majority of the costs of special education expenditures. And that's taken directly from the Department of Public Instruction resources. When Fund 10 to Fund 27 transfers are discussed, or when the amount of the operating budget that's allocated to special education costs over time are discussed, this is what we're talking about. Taxpayer dollars start in Fund 10 when they are going to be used for special education, they must be transferred to Fund 27. We only transfer Fund $10 to Fund $27 when we need to move those Medicaid payments that come uh, years after they've been incurred into Fund 27 or when we require more, when we require taxpayer dollars to even out the amount of money that we spend on the provision of special education costs. 
Here you can see how that has played out in Sun Prairie over the past seven years. Remember that local funding sources have historically covered 60% of the excess costs of providing special education in Wisconsin school districts. We're going to look at this funding source more deeply in the next several slides. Our school board is particularly interested in the amount of local money spent to fund special education costs. This concept came up with the board during our direct inspection in February of 2024 and requires deeper explanation. This portion of our presentation is that deeper explanation. This table represents the local Fund 10 contribution to Fund 27 special ed costs over the past six years. Remember, federal and state funding does not and is not meant to cover all special education costs. Every school district has to use local funds for the majority of their special education costs. Excess costs of special education funded through the transfer from Fund 10 have decreased as a percentage of overall Fund 10 budget. That's what's shown in the last column that's circled on this slide. This indicates that special education costs have increased at a lower rate than other operational costs in the district. The school board is particularly interested in understanding how local funding of special education in Sun Prairie compares to the local funding of special education across Dane County. First of all, remember that these transfers from Fund 10 to Fund 27 exist because local dollars bear the most responsibility for costs of special education. This graph, originally shared with you during the board's direct inspection last February, shows that in 2022, Sun Prairie, Middleton, Middleton Cross Plains, DeForest, Wanakee, and Verona all transferred an average of 9.6% of their operating budgets to Fund 27 in support of the excess costs of providing special education. Sun Prairie is not significantly different from these four districts. This graph also shows how that percentage translates into a per pupil total student dollar amount if distributed across every student who's attending each of those districts evenly. In 2022, Sun Prairie spent $205 more per student, that's less than 1% more, in the district than the mean per pupil amount of all Dane County school districts compared. It's important to understand that this expenditure is not significantly different than the mean expenditure of other Dane County districts. Again, it's more than, it's only 1% more than our operating expense. And when making this same comparison to an established peer group, Sun Prairie, Verona, Middleton Cross Plains, all used an average of 9.6% of local dollars to balance the expenditures for students with disabilities. Oshkosh spent about 10.14%. The other nine comparison districts spent between 8.97 and 7.68%, with the mean being 8.45. In 2022, Sun Prairie transferred 1.5% more local dollars than the mean of our size alike peer group to cover the excess cost of providing special education services. Also from the board direct inspection from February of 2024, this slide shows the amount of local dollars spent on the excess cost of providing special education by each Dane County school district, distributed among all students in the district over time. The bottom part of this slide also shows the percentage of the local tax dollars provided to the school district that go toward the excess costs of special education over time. 
the amount of local Sun Prairie tax dollars needed to cover the cost of educating our students with disabilities is going up over time. And this is a relatively consistent trend across Dane County. The percentage of local Sun Prairie tax dollars being used to pay for the excess cost of special education has remained steady for 13 years and has decreased in the last three years. Thanks for hanging in there with those complicated explanations. So to be clear, probably the best way to compare our special education costs over time to comparison districts is by calculating the cost of Fund 20 expenditures per each pupil with disabilities. And that's what we have in this table here. This table includes both size like districts and Dane County districts. We are eighth of 18 total comparisons in per pupil with disabilities spending. We are seventh of 10 in Dane County per pupil with disabilities spending. And we are a third of 10 when compared to size like districts across the state. In summary, the special education funding model does not provide enough federal or state funding to cover the total excess costs of special education services. We have to rely on local dollars to make up the difference. Since 2007, our district has been used to using between 10 and 13% of our operating budget to cover the excess costs of special education services. And this had been tolerable for the better part of 13 years when we were experiencing significant growth and we were receiving a per pupil increase from the state. When our district experienced three years of enrollment stagnation, zero per pupil increase in state funding and increased inflation costs for services, the operating budget experienced strain. And accordingly, we have been decreasing the amount of local dollars used for special education costs since 2022. Our total special education expenditures have increased over 30% during the past seven years, however. Our population of students with disabilities has increased by 36%. The discomfort of this budgetary impact is being felt now through special education staffing levels across the system as professionals are operating, are working with caseloads higher than the established ranges that we have for our system. Okay, this might be an excellent place to pause. The cognitive load of this presentation from this point forward will be significantly less. You just learned some really hard concepts about special education funding. There's nothing easy or even logical about special ed funding. The next portion of this presentation will focus on how our special ed services have evolved over time. The board has asked us to reflect on what has changed in our special education programming in our school district over the past decade or more. Looking back at our special education services and service provision, there are six categories that capture the ways in which we have evolved over time. And I will cover those six categories over these next two slides. First of all, we've changed in how we have had to provide highly qualified staff. As the state of Wisconsin shifted from disability specific licensure areas to cross categorical general licensure areas, districts have been left to provide the specialized skill building that teachers used to get from institutes of higher learning and still need in order to work with specific disability related needs. In Sun Prairie, we've done this by starting our autism resource team, our SMART team, our low incidence resource team, and our mentoring models. Over the years, we've also experienced increased competition for highly qualified professionals. All areas within special education are hard to fill professional areas. We've been meeting this challenge by increasing our recruitment efforts, establishing a positive professional reputation locally, and intentionally tending to the development and well being of our professional teams in order to increase connection. We have also been highly supportive of professionals with emergency license. Finally, as part of the mentoring program that our school district is obligated to provide, we provide a full release mentor for cross categorical special education teachers. And we have also developed a job alike related services mentoring program where current employees are paid a stipend to mentor newly licensed related service providers. Our student needs have changed over time in this district. We have a higher prevalence of students with sensory regulatory disability related needs. Students with anxiety, neurodiverse students, 
students on both the autism and the attention spectrum, and students who have experienced trauma or who have mental health concerns are students who manifest with sensory regulation disability related needs. We have built the capacity of educators to be more supportive of these needs through the autism resource team, the SMART team, through our nonviolent crisis intervention de-escalation trainings, and through trauma-informed practices. We have increased the universal education of students, families, and staff with these disability-related needs through our Autism Acceptance Month, Disability Pride Month, and disability as part of our Department of Systemic Equity and Inclusion. In order to provide students age three through five who are not yet in kindergarten with an education in a natural environment with non-disabled peers, we have strategically increased our early childhood community partners. We've also seen an increasing number of students with very complex support needs, which has led us to adopt a specific reading and math curriculum aligned to the essential elements, which are the alternative standards for students who take the alternative statewide assessment. We've also developed improved tools for collaboration between teachers, and we've developed the Low Incidence Leadership Group. And finally, the requests for special education evaluations for preschool children come from children who are transitioning out of birth to three county services at the point of their third birthday, and also from medical providers in response to observing, observing lagging disability um, developmental milestones. These referrals have to be responded to in the order that they're received and as they are received. And we have to dedicate early childhood evaluation team who conducts evaluations year round in an early, and an early childhood developmental specialist who coordinates all of these evaluations. In the area of leadership, our evolution has been uh, significant and steady. Every public school system establishes a model to implement the highly specialized legal and compliance oriented nature of special education. There's no one right way, but the end result has to be compliance to the law and the delivery of services that support local instructional programming. In Sun Prairie, we have successfully designed and implemented a site-based leadership model that's highly successful in supporting compliance and instructional coherence. Increasing special education leadership requirements coupled with the establishment of our robust, equitable, multi-level systems of supports for academics and social emotional learning that is inclusive of school-based mental health required additional district level coordination and leadership. Our district responded by adding a second director of student services. Over the past 10 years, we have also increased access to the whole school experience for students with disabilities. Typically, when people think about school, we think just about what happens during the time when students are present for learning, but we are required to think about the before, during, and after school sponsored activities that are available to all students when we think about the school experience for students with disabilities as well. So to that end, we have increased student access to extracurricular activities. We strategized and specifically targeted the beginning of an adapted sports league, which you've heard about and started in Sun Prairie, which is now spreading out across Dane County. We reduced barriers to participation in after-school clubs. We provide um, American Sign Language interpretation for performance events like plays and musicals. And because caregivers have said that finding anything in the community for children with disabilities outside of the school system is a challenge, we also support school community schools participation. In fact, the percent participation of students with disabilities in community schools activities is proportionate to the representation of students with disabilities in the district, 14%. Students with disabilities have access to a wide range of course options and electives from early child, from elementary school all the way through high school. Students participate in a variety of ways in band and choir. In high school, they have access to unified physical education and una voce, as well as our other PE and choir opportunities. They attend dances and after school events, and our district supports Special Olympics. As our district has added facilities due to growth, we have been mindful and inclusive of the needs of our bookend programs for students in early childhood and adult transition program. When Token Springs was built, the Early Learning Resource Center was designed as a part of that school. As the professional learning, the professional learning center was renovated, dignified and appropriate space for adults in our 
adult transition program was included. Our schools will all receive updates to their playgrounds to increase accessibility for students with mobility needs. And our schools are rethinking fun runs to be physically inclusive. Our district leadership models and teams have continued to become more inclusive and integrated. The assistive technology team that we have for students with disabilities is integrated into our district's technology team so that we're making decisions about the universal technology that's available for all students that supports students who absolutely need to have that level of assistive technology. Our teaching, learning, and equity directors lead collaboratively on behalf of all students. Our athletic director oversees adaptive sports and Special Olympics in the same way that he oversees all of our other extracurriculars. We've gone from being a district that had two transportation companies, one for special ed and one for general ed, to a district that works with one transportation company for all students. We've gone from being a district that has one paperwork system for IEPs and special education evaluations um, and a separate one for our student information management system to a district that has one single system for paperwork and student information, and that's Infinite Campus. Our food service is phenomenal in accommodating students with communication needs by providing visuals so that students can make meaningful choices about the foods that they use. They're also great about using, encouraging students to use their augmentative communication devices when ordering food and going through the lunch line. Additionally, they don't think twice about doing special food prep, like providing blended meals for our students who have to take their food in that capacity. And our facilities and operations crew is the best when it comes to helping put up the communication boards that we're putting on all of our playgrounds and it, putting a plan together to increase accessibility of our playgrounds. And then working with to increase caregivers of students with disabilities, feeling of belonging at their schools is a priority for Sun Prairie. And we've done this by examining representation and communication and presence at family fun nights of our caregivers of students with disabilities, along with their SEO participation. This localizes advocacy at the level where it is most impactful for their students. Over the past 10 years, we've, contribute, we've continued to contribute to the profession of special education beyond the school district. At a national level, I participated in the seclusion and restraint advisory, advisory interviews um, with a team from the U.S. Government Accountability Office in 2019 as Congress asked the United States to come up with revised guidance on seclusion and restraint. Sun Prairie co-hosted the Urban Collaborative with MMSD, where we were able to host districts from host leaders from districts across the nation and spotlight some of the practices that we have in Sun Prairie and in Madison. I've participated by request in the Disability Rights California's Education Summit in February of 2022 to reopen, reinvest, and reimagine schools that successfully educate students with intersectional disabilities. Nikki Harkis and I presented at the Association of Washington State Principals Professional Development on Leading Inclusive Schools. And our very own Becky Penikoff, Student Services Coordinator for Early Childhood, just got back from presenting at the Division for Early Childhood National Conference in September. And she and a team have also recently presented at the Urban Collaborative on our inclusive practices in early childhood. And finally, we have an Adapted Physical Education Teacher of the Year in Sadie Brown. At the state level, I've participated in the Wisconsin DPI Staffing Challenges Focus Group. Wendy Brody participates in the Infinite Campus Users Group, High Cost um, Calculation Collaboration with other district administrative associates, and she also supports new administrative support staff through mentoring as they come into their jobs. Janet and Jennifer collaboratively problem solve with other Dane County districts, and then we also teach. Locally, we've put our efforts into advocating with community organizations to increase their accessibility for children and people with disabilities in Sun Prairie. We've done this through past participation on the Youth and Families Commission, current participation on the Miracle League local leadership team, advocacy for accessible community playgrounds through our physical therapists. Um, we've worked with the ARC Dane County to provide family university nights to build caregivers' understanding of community resources, especially as their children transition into adult services. And lastly, we provided resources to medical providers to help them understand the difference between educational disability and medical disability so that they're able to provide caregivers with meaningful information at the first point of contact. And lastly, the area in which we've evolved significantly over the last six years is our fiscal area, the fiscal responsibility. 
we carefully consider the cost versus the benefit and any additional related administrative costs that might be associated with accessing flexible federal and state available resources. For example, we have pursued grants such as the Universal Design for Learning grant and the ES3 grant, which is involved in supporting the social emotional learning of neurodiverse students. One example of where we have said no to competitive grants is the transition grant. Transition grant. The benefit was, has not been apparent to us when we consider the cost of applying. We contract for services and we engage in intra-district position sharing when that is most cost effective. Most recently, um, we worked with a vision teacher over time until she retired on a contracted basis. It was not District FTE. We currently share a physical therapist with the Middleton Cross Plains School District, and we have previously shared a deaf and hard of hearing teacher with Middleton. Managing the unanticipated costs of student mobility during the year and between school years has been an in intensive area of study for us. We've analyzed the mobility trends and we've established our decision-making points throughout the calendar accordingly so that we do not over or under react to changes in student um, enrollment. And lastly, in the area of compensation, we work very closely with human resources in order to attract and retain highly, highly qualified staff from a financial perspective. We started a Grow Your Own pilot in special education with emergency licensed teachers before the district started the program. We additionally, additional compensation to base salary for the advanced degrees and national certifications required by some of the positions that by some of the certifications that the positions hold in our district has happened over time. And we monitor the compensation trends in other Dane County districts to try to be appropriately responsive in collaboration with human resources. All right, and that ends our looking backward. And we're now moving on to present state where we'll look at enrollment and budget. This is our third Friday special education student count snapshot. Our schools are represented down the left side, disability areas across the top. Total numbers down the right side. We are up 103 students with disabilities from last third Friday to this third Friday. This is our largest net gain by 30 students in our students with disabilities count from one third Friday to the next since we began calculating this in the 2016-17 school year. We are used to seeing some movement up and down across disability areas in schools. The following unanticipated changes have occurred over the summer and have significantly impacted the landscapes of our schools. At Creekside, we are up 21 students with disabilities. At Northside, we're up 10. Royal Oaks, we're up 15. And at Central Heights Middle School, we are up 20 students with disabilities. Across our system, we have 60 more students with autism at this time of year compared to last year, which is evidence of the increased um, regulatory needs of our students that I mentioned earlier. And finally, the number of students attending private schools who are eligible for the equitable services that we're required to provide in private schools is up by seven. This table and pie graph represents the ways in which our special education monies were distributed during the 23-24 school year. As you can see, the majority of our costs are in salaries and benefits. Likewise, this table and pie graph represent the ways in which we anticipate spending our special ed monies during this school year. The majority of our costs will continue to be in salaries and benefits. Remembering that Fund 27 is the singular fund that holds the local, state, and federal money that goes towards the paying for special education services. The board asked us to share how we measure our success as part of this report. And we draw from, from three sources to assess our performance. First, we look at local outcome data. We also look at state performance plan indicators. And then we look at forward achievement data comparisons internally and across key districts. Locally, we monitor success through annual review of disaggregated data in our district data playbook, which feeds scorecards and student results policies. The data playbook contains academic and social emotional behavioral screening data, growth percentiles, assessment data, grades, attendance, and perceptions data, etc. All disaggregated by schools and student demographics. You'll hear more about this data in upcoming elementary and secondary reports throughout this year. The federal and legal nature of special education requires that local districts across the state are accountable for contributing to the improvement of outcomes of children with disabilities in Wisconsin. 
The state of Wisconsin measures this through the Wisconsin State Performance Plan, which you can see on the right side of this report. This visual shows you the 14 indicators that make up the state performance plan. In Sun Prairie, we meet compliance in all indicators, and I will dive into some that are particularly noteworthy a bit later. The third source of success metrics is our forward state assessment data over time. We begin by looking at our district aggregate internal ELA and math forward proficiency over time. Our students with disabilities have been making steady growth in English language arts and math as measured by the forward exam over the past four years. We more than doubled our percent proficient trajectory in ELA over the past four years, and we nearly doubled our percent proficient in, proficient in math over the same amount of time. We aim to continue this trajectory. Next, we look at our trends in forward ELA and math over time compared with size-like districts. You will not see 23-24 comparison data because it's not been publicly available at the time of this recording. This is, how our local proficient, this is how our proficiency trajectory compares to other districts our size over time in 23, in 22-23. 10% of our students with disabilities are proficient in English language arts. The range of proficiency for size-like districts across the state is between 8 and 14%. 13% of our students with disabilities are proficient in math. The range of proficiency for size-like districts across the state is between 10 and 18%. We also like to look at trends in our forward ELA and math um, outcomes over time compared with other districts in Dane County. In 2022-23, 10% of our students with disabilities were proficient in ELA, English language arts. The range of proficiency for local Dane County districts is between 11 and 33%. 13% of our students were proficient in math. The range of proficiency for size-like districts in math in Dane County, sorry, for the range of proficiency for districts in Dane County is between 13 and 31%. Having reviewed our three success metrics, we've identified four specific celebrations and one large challenge to share with you all. I previously shared that the growth in number of community-based partners that we work with to design inclusive early childhood programs has been strategic work of the past 10 years. This table shows the State Performance Plan Indicator 6A for preschool, and it shows the most recent data that goes along with that strategic focus. Sun Prairie is well above the target expectation, the state average, and the Dane County average on these same measures. We have made a concerted effort in this area for our youngest scholars. Our programming is celebrated and recognized as a model of access and instruction for early childhood across the state. There are two ways to look at high school completion for students with disabilities. The graph on the left tells the story of what happens for students with disabilities after they've completed four years of high school. We celebrate that the majority of our students either take their diplomas, they've met their graduation requirements, or they continue their post-secondary readiness in our adult transition program. The table on the right reflects State Performance Indicator 1, the percentage of students with disabilities who graduated with a Sun Prairie diploma as it relates to our comparison districts. Sun Prairie's graduation rate at the end of four years exceeds both the indicator target and the state indicator average. We also rank at the top of our comparison districts. This is the most current data available in WiseDash, and our internal data on the left shows that we can anticipate this standing to continue. The Sun Prairie Area School District values the positive engagement of caregivers with students with disabilities. Indicator 8 of the State Performance Plan reflects the outcomes of parent engagement surveys that are conducted every five years. There are two surveys one for caregivers of preschool students and one for caregivers of students who are in kindergarten through the age of 21. We celebrate having met our completion target rate for both survey years, increasing our preschool participation by 14% and our school age participation by 9% from survey year to another. We've remained consistent or grown in the percentage of caregivers who respond, agree or dis agree or strongly agree with the questions indicating a welcoming, respectful, and supportive environment. And finally, I'm sharing this celebration in particular for any special education staff, 
our Crosscat teachers, related service providers, associate principals, student services coordinators, who may be tuning in for this report and our school psychs and social workers. This is new information and it feels really good to share it here. This is a really big deal. We have just successfully completed our procedural self-assessment compliance audit with the Department of Public Instruction. During this audit, we undergo over a year long process to assess procedural compliance with our evaluations, our IEPs, our discipline, implementation, and shortened days. We started this work in August of 23 and we ended this week. Um, the quote from the person from DPI that worked with us uh, said, I am so impressed with the work of your district. This is very challenging to accomplish with such a large district and such a large staff. Thank you and your staff for your hard work. This is a sign of our calibration across the system, calibration and compliance that is highly individualized and legal. And this is the basis for all special education progress. We have to be compliant before we can make progress. Otherwise, we will just be chasing legal compliance. The best way to communicate our greatest challenge in special education is to share our teaching, learning, and equity team's equity-focused problem of practice. Every major data point that we monitor in our district reflects a significant gap between the outcomes and experiences of our students with disabilities and our students without. Those gaps are compounded for students whose identities intersect multiple categories. This is the work. This problem of practice is what drives our most strategic and transformational leadership work. It takes a long time to change decades of disproportionality, and that change has to happen in the core experience in the classroom. We are committed to this work for as long as it takes. And there is hope. These indicators on this slide align with each area of our instructional framework, experiences, environment, and equity. And we're beginning to see the changes. We won't stop until we have arrived. Along with covering special education broadly, the school board has asked me to address our adult transition program specifically. I had hoped to welcome Leah Schmidt, job development specialist and designated adult transition representative to join me for this portion of this report, but she's ill. So you get me to continue. You're lucky. All right. Remembering that IDEA, the special education law, applies to students from age three through 21. Um, we're going to spend some time spotlighting adult transition and providing context. It's through Adult Transition Program that we provide services for our students who have completed their four years of high school and still have some post-secondary goals to work on before leaving us all together. <clears throat> adult Transition Services are individually designed based upon each student's post-secondary transition plan, which is completed in their IEP meeting. The length of time needed for each student to reach their goals can vary. It, it's determined by the IEP team. Some students may stick around for an extra six months. Some students may stay through the school year in which they turn 21. It just depends on the variable nature of the student's needs. The law says that programming should occur where same-aged, non-disabled peers are learning, working, and living. Programming is rooted in collaboration between the student, their family, the school team, and the outside agencies that will take over service provision once the students leave high school services at age 21 or sooner. And then finally, as each student approaches their exit date, the services begin to shift from the school to the outside agencies and the outside community resources that the students will work with once they leave public education. The Adult Transition Program Information Brochure says it best. Adult Transition is a community-based program that focuses on employability skills and exploration, self-advocacy, and adult daily living skills. The goal of Adult Transition is to work with students, caregivers, and post-secondary agencies to support the student's transition to life after high school. This slide shows what those three areas look like in greater detail. IEP teams determine what students need to work on, and then their program is customized. 
there's a self-assessment rubric that helps to inform that process. Adult transition program is unique in that no two years look exactly the same. The amount, the type, and the location of services depends upon the students who are enrolled, who are enrolled and their IEP transition goals. We currently have 27 students who are engaged in the adult transition program. Of these 27, eight are going to exit this year. We're anticipating between 15 and 18 new students will join the program with the 25-26 school year. And I share that just to show the variable nature of enrollment over time. We currently have four teachers and seven special education assistants who together absorb, stretch, and adapt based upon student needs and numbers. Collaborative agencies are fundamental to the success of the adult transition program, just like early childhood re relies on community partnerships to provide inclusive and age appropriate opportunities for our littles. Adult transition program relies on community agencies to support the transition to adulthood for our adult students. The main agencies that we collaborate with are listed here on this slide. Some students participate in Madison College or other training programs as part of adult transition. We currently have two students who are at Madison College and we have another that's going to join at semester. This year, we also have a student who's participating in an online skill-based certification program. Developing vocational skills is a cornerstone of the adult transition program. We want every student who leaves to be able to engage in some amount of paid employment. There are currently 11 different vocational sites where we can teach students specific job skill, skills, as well as habits of work. We have three new ones this year that I'll talk about a little bit on the next slide. Students in their exiting year work at customized paid employment sites. We currently have seven sites that students are working at for money. These sites were found by our community partners and is an example of how school and community support teams work together to support students' successful transitions into their adult support agencies. Part of the adult transition program includes participation and membership at community recreation sites in Sun Prairie and Madison. It's part of being a whole person. We work and we play. These community experiences include um, learning how to navigate public transportation in Sun Prairie and in Madison, as well as learning how to identify the free or low cost options for recreation within the two communities. And finally, many students participate in specific lesson groups. There's a variety of options available for students' schedules and needs, and lessons are based upon self, a self-assessment rubric, and they all happen at the Professional Learning Center. The students who remain in public school beyond their four years of high school are typically the students with the, most, with the highest needs in our district. Our adult transition program staff is so gifted because of their advocacy our Sun Prairie community has become increasingly able to see the meaningful contributions that people with disabilities can provide in our communities and workplaces. The Professional Learning Center location supports the community-based focus in an age-appropriate environment with access to employment, skill building, community building, and independence. Uh, Nicole Tepfer, the administrator at the site, has been phenomenal with working with our adult transition staff to develop multiple vocational um, opportunities within the Professional Learning Center, as well as being inclusive of our adults in the Professional Learning Center community building activities. Our 23-24 Exeters were our largest group yet. We said goodbye to 14 students at the end of last school year. The huge celebration is that each and every one of those students exited with a meaningful day. 12 of the 14 students exited with paid employment as part of that day, which is also huge. The resources that it took to maintain and sustain that throughout the year was really significant. Sun Prairie vocational training sites continue to grow in our community. New this year, we have a site at the public library, the Loop on Main Street, and the Sunshine Place. These three sites are joining established partners like Explore Children's Museum, Our Savior's Lutheran Church, the YMCA, the Kitchen at West High School, and many more. The impact of the adult transition program has expanded beyond Sun Prairie. 
Gingerbread House has been hiring our students competitively for three years. Their commitment to providing dignifying competitive employment now extends beyond Sun Prairie into their other community locations within Dane County for people with disabilities. And finally, networking is central to the continued success of the Adult Transition Program. Leah Schmidt represents the Sun Prairie community on the County Community on Transition Participation Grant. This network provides one necessary place for collaboration um, that is germane to the success of the program. Speaking of which, the board has asked us specifically how you can support Adult Transition Program. And we say you could do that by being a part of our network. If you or anybody that you know um, could become a potential partner for a vocational opportunity um, where we can train students with um, job skills um, prior to going into competitive employment, please contact Leah Schmidt, whose email information is listed here on this slide. As we come to a close in our presentation, let's remember what we've covered. We've established the context for this work. It's embedded in our district vision, mission, and core values. We looked back at where we've been through a review of our enrollment, funding, and services over about the past 10 years. We reviewed our present state of enrollment, budget, and success metrics. And then finally, we shared a service spotlight with you on the Adult Transition Program. And now we'd like to share our future focus for special education continued improvement. We are focused on three areas moving forward. We are focused on student achievement, staff recruitment and retention, and collaboration with caregivers. Mm -hmm. Our student achievement is going to happen the more students are able to access and achieve grade level essential standards. And that will come through the collaborative design of challenging instruction by our adults. It's important for us to have highly qualified professionals working with our students in our district. And we will do this through continued um, development of strong collaborative professional teams. And lastly, we're going to continue to hone our abilities to collaborate with the caregivers beginning at their home school through communication, compromise, co-creation of goals, and compassion. I have been one voice speaking on behalf of the hundreds who, of hundreds who do this work every day with great passion and dedication. And I want to close with deep gratitude for those people who are behind this work and the work we shared with you today. The professional educators and support staff of our Sun Prairie Area School District are behind the achievement results of our students in all of the different ways. Our Sun Prairie Area School District Leadership Collaborative sets the conditions both within our schools and at the systems level for this work to occur. And I'm grateful to work with such a collaborative an inclusive group of professionals. And finally, relative to this presentation, I can't say thank you enough to Wendy Brody, Robin Gardner, and Janet Thomas for hours and hours of technical support and work related to this presentation. And finally, thank you, our school board, for your interest in and support of each and every one of our students. Feel free to share any questions ahead of time um, before we come and see you on October 14th. Otherwise, Janet and I look forward to seeing you then. Take care.